So today we're talking about same stuff, different day. Yes. Here we go. Solomon continues the pattern that we've seen in so many of these other great leaders. So mm-hmm. that's what we're talking about today on AC Daily. You're listening to another episode of HC Daily, a daily devotional podcast that you can listen to at home or on the go. We believe that you can grow as much as you want to grow spiritually, and this podcast can be a part of your daily growth plan. So, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, we're glad you're here. Now, let's join our hosts, Jeff Forrester and Chris Zarbaugh in the studio. So, Chris, I was thinking today, uh, we forgot... On Friday last week was our 100th podcast. Woohoo! 100. So, woo! Yeah. Woo. Late, late party. But yeah, uh, yeah there so is. there's that. I had the privilege of talking with several of our young people uh, mm. this week who listen to the podcast. So, uh, Jade, if you're listening, I'm saying your name, or Gabe, if you're listening, quit rooting for Ohio. Uh, so, Gabe told me that he loves our podcast, mm. but he agrees with you. He likes Ohio State better than Michigan. Nice. And so I asked his dad to take him home and ground him. Oh, so well, that was, you know, that's it's what that's what you guys do. You just persecute unfairly and well, no, say, say stuff all the time. There needs, that's there needs not to true. be consequences to bad choices in your life, and that's what our topic is today. <laughs> so, oh, that's it. So, okay. <laughs> so here we go. So kids, man, they've been listening to this podcast. So I was thinking, uh, what is your favorite? Uh, uh, summertime refreshment, that thing that, to cool down, like ice cream, popsicles, whatever, whatever. When you, you so you tell me, what's yeah, your favorite? I, I would, I would summertime say sw- refreshment? swimming. Swimming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swimming for me is uh, like super great, and and I always, um, I always regret when I wade in slowly. Mm-hmm. You know, you wade in, and every well, that was every, be my next question. Every level is is all. Yeah. So I'm a jump in kind of guy. Okay, just get yeah. soaking wet. Yeah, just go right for it. Yeah, yeah. Because it's so much better always. You fear it more, mm-hmm. but it's always better. Do you like fresh water or salt water? Fresh water. Fresh water? Yeah. Are you scared of the sharks in salt water? No, my wife and all of my kids are. Yeah. But I am not. Yeah. I quit yeah. swimming in the ocean. Uh, uh, we were at the beach and people started trying to roll me back out in the water. And it just made me mad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Funny. So anyways, uh, good. That was really interesting. Yeah. So we didn't know that. So your favorite way to refresh is swimming. It is. Okay. Do you have a favorite like cool snack? Uh, well, it's always ice cream. Ice cream? Ice cream wins. Chocolate? Nope. <laughs> Never chocolate. Well, then dude. let's quit talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. What's your favorite kind of ice cream? Uh, it's butter pecan. Butter pecan? Really? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's my dad's. Mm. So, yeah, and he's 84, so that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's... Uh... <laughs> or it makes no sense whatsoever. No, no, I put those together because uh, the only people I know that oh, <laughs> eat that kind of ice funny. cream is old people. That's funny. Okay, so uh, we're reading today in First Kings chapter 11, and um, I'm sorry for wasting three minutes. No, that's okay. So uh, we're going to read from verse 1 through verse like 25, and here we go. So this is 20 years into Solomon's ministry, roughly, mm. at this point. So it says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from uh, the Hittites. And the Lord clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. It's amazing how the Lord knows what he's talking about. Mm. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord as God as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and he refused to follow the Lord completely, as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Shemoth, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. The Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And he warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. But for the sake of your father, David, I will not do this while you are still alive. I'll take the kingdom away from your son. And even so, I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be the king of one tribe for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. 
Then the Lord raised up Hadad the Edomite, a member of Edom's royal family, to be Solomon's adversary. Years before David had defeated Edom, Joab, his army's commander, had stayed and buried to bury some of the Israelite soldiers who had died in battle. And while they were there, they killed every male in Edom. Joab and the army of Israel had stayed there for six months, killing them. But Hadad and a few of his father's royal officials escaped and headed for Egypt. Hadad was just a boy at the time, and they set out from Midian and went to Paran, and there others joined them, and they traveled to Egypt and went to Pharaoh, who gave them a home, food, and some land. And Pharaoh grew very fond of Hadad and gave him his wife's sister in marriage, the sister of Queen Tapanes. She bore him a son named Ganubath. These people have weird names. Ugh. Tapanes raised him in Pharaoh's palace among Pharaoh's own sons, and then when the news reached Hadad in Egypt that David and his commanders Joab were both dead. He said to Pharaoh, let me return to my own country. Why? Pharaoh asked him. Why do you lack, what do you lack here that makes you want to go home? Nothing, he replied. But even so, please let me return home. And God also raised up Rezan, son of Eliada, as Solomon's adversary. And we can just go on from there. Basically what happens is from the north and from the south, from this point on, Solomon always has trouble at the borders. There's always somebody fighting him. And prior to this, the first 20 years, it was just all peace all the time for Solomon. Yeah. And it's because he rebelled against God. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, we open up the podcast by saying, same story another day. It seems yeah. like <clears throat> there's so much habitual behavior in, in uh, humanity. Yeah. You know, and here are these kings get in power, and uh, Solomon knows that women were the downfall of, of his father. And as great as his father was as a ruler— and, you know, he had his mistakes. Women were kind of, you know, it definitely was yeah. uh, the downside. And uh, God never uh, approved marrying multiple women. Yeah. And yet kings of that day kind of modeled other pagan countries and did what they wanted to. And uh, that was apparently acceptable behavior in Solomon's eyes, yeah. but not in God's. But, you know, we usually tend to think that the, the amount that we do is the right amount. Mm. So if you ask David, how many wives is the right number of wives for a king? He'd go, oh, about... 10, <laughs> right? right? And, but boy, those kings, they have 20 wives. They're, they're out of control. Mm. And so we tend to justify our level of wrongdoing as about the right amount. And then everybody else beyond that, that, that's really bad. But what we forget is that our kids and the people who follow us, what we do, what we think we're doing in moderation, the people who follow us, our children and whatever, they do to excess. Yeah, and that, that's a really a great lesson uh, because... Uh, you, we need to compare ourselves to the right thing, not to the wrong thing. Right. And so it's a. It reminded me of a story. My best buddy Jeff. Uh, he actually. Thank you. He. Uh, well, not you. It oh. was Jeff Miller <laughs> at the time of this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, best I buddy, know Jeff. He's a great guy. Yeah. I know, so Jeff Miller. Uh, one time we were in Bible college, and and he actually said to me, he said something like, uh, "My wife keeps on saying we we need to go to." like this marriage counseling. And he says, you know, she says, we need to do this. We need to pray together. And, you know, here she is like comparing her marriage to, you know, a, a really good idealistic, you mm -hmm. know, type desirable marriage. Yeah. And he goes, and you know what I told her? I told her, man, you have it good. He goes, I don't come home drunk. I don't, I don't hit you. Hmm. I don't yell at you. And he goes, you have it good. What are you complaining about? He goes, is this not good enough? And I looked at him and I go, Jeff, I'm pretty sure that you're not <laughs> holding the bar high enough to right. what you're trying to compare your marriage to. I'm like, are you kidding? Right, right. I'm like, you're comparing, you, you justify what you do because you're comparing it to your dad. By people who are worse than you or right. behave worse than right, you. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's what you just said, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So what we do in moderation, they do in excess always. And this is what you're seeing in Solomon's life. His dad had 10 wives, so I think we have a thousand. Yeah. Wow. Right. A thousand. Oof. Crazy. Well, I mean, he was, you know, he, he was the wisest king. He, he definitely had the uh, the riches more than any other king before him. Mm -hmm. So he probably thought his, you know, his, yeah. he, well, had, the Bible, he had more liberty. The Bible says he's the wisest man that ever lived, but I can guarantee you this, he was never right in his own house. Right, <laughs> right, right, because, because of that. Yeah, yeah, that's so fun. <laughs> You know, you know what's so interesting is that, uh, you know, we read over these weird names and also the weird names of these gods, but like, like it says, uh, the God of Molech, like that is a God who, who, whose, whose specialty is children's sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, we're talking like, these are detestable pagan gods. Yeah. There, there were some that had like giant, um, brass bowls like this and they would do a fire underneath. That's Molech. And, yeah. And then yeah. sacrifice the baby yeah, yeah, in yeah. that. In that red hot, yes, that's what, horrific. Yeah, yeah. Now that wasn't super common, but it was a practice for Molech, and so the Bible calls him detestable. So God hates all the gods, 
But he specifically mentions Molech twice as being a detestable god. Yeah. Just beyond all the just beyond the pale. The word that they used, by the way, that the, the Hebrews used for these gods combined together. Um that they would refer to them, uh, if we translated it now, it would be like king. So this is going to be one of the other reasons why God hated these gods, is because God was the king. Mm. And now here you have Solomon leading the people for other kings. That's why I remember in the, in the book of Exodus, it says, you will have no other gods before me. Right. So God's saying, I'm the king. I'm your king. And now they were recognizing them as having some kind of authority in their life. Yeah, another great lesson that we could pull from here is that uh, there is a warning literally given, and it said, God told, you know, Solomon and the people of Israel, you must not marry wives because they will influence or turn your hearts. Foreign wives. Uh, foreign wives, right. And yeah. uh, and Solomon did not think that that was going to be true, and then it says, but it was true. Right. And it, it, so never underestimate the power of influence. You know, so the people that you are around, uh, you may never think, you know, that you'll be influenced in a certain way, but when you're around it more and more, what happens is you have tolerance, mm-hmm. you know, right. build up. Uh, it reminds me of um, Lot pitching his tent towards mm-hmm. Sodom, mm-hmm. right? And and you know, oh, we're not going to come near Sodom. We're going to we're going to camp on the hill. Yeah. And then the very you know the very next chapter says that Lot was living in Sodom as a prominent member of the community. Right. And so yeah, influence is a big thing. Well, you start getting comfortable with something, right? And and so familiarity breeds comfortability. I think a lot of times. Mm. So you don't always start off going to ruin your life. You're just going to hang out for a little while. And the next thing you know, you get sucked in. How many times have you heard people tell you, I can't believe I did that. I just was there to hang out with friends. Mm. And next thing you know, they get high or they get drunk. They get in a car accident on the way home, something. I've heard the story so many times. You don't have to, usually most people don't decide to ruin their lives today. Right. But you get really comfortable around the kinds of things that could and that's what happens with, with Solomon, I think, as he starts marrying women. Now, just to be clear, when it talks about he began to marry many former women, God's not against uh, marrying people from other countries. It, it was the godlessness of the people, right? So God had warned the people of Israel, stay true and pure in your religion. And so, you know, I have a friend who just married a, a, a lady from another country. The God's not forbidding that. Right. Right. Well, what of he, course. What, what he's saying is, so it's not a racial issue. It's not a nationalistic issue. Yeah. It's a faith-based issue that these women brought false gods. That's a really good point. He, so he, he, was, he was going. So for practical purposes, all the young people listening today, um, eventually when you date, the first thing you need to do is make sure that not just that they believe in God, but they're as committed to being a follower of Jesus as you are, or more, right? And um, that, that's incredibly important. Otherwise, most of the time, God's people step away from their faith and follow something else. It just happens, and it happens over and over and over again. And it's amazing how God knew that's what would happen. It's exactly what he said. And in fact, they did, he, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. The Lord said, don't do it, because your heart's going to turn. And then he goes, oh, I'm the wisest man in the world. I can marry 700 wives and 300 concubines. I'm going to follow God. And then it says, in fact, what God said was going to happen is what happened. Yeah. And, and that's, it, has a tendency to, that, it has a tendency to play out that way every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> every what time. Because what God says is usually true. He, he's never wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's so funny because as a, as a youth pastor, we call it uh, missionary dating, right? Mm-hmm. You've used that term. Sure, sure. No, missionary dating, where you date somebody who doesn't believe, but he's such a great guy. Right. So all I have to do is lead him, lead him to Christ, and then mm-hmm. you know we'll hook him and we'll just missionary date. And uh, and so we always give advice to you know either our kids, but at this at this point when we're coaching high school students, I always say, hey, just just don't even go out with them if they right. if they're if they're not a believer or if they believe something different or whatever. And uh, but the funny thing is, when I was young, I never really followed that. I, I didn't learn that till later, mm-hmm. right? Because I became a Christian when I was like 16. Right. So um, so anyway, I saw my daughter do this. My daughter, actually, Sarah, who's now married, and she's 28. Back when she was 16, she was asked out on a date, and she said, no, I don't think I'm going to go because what's the point? Because he's never going to be anybody I want to marry. And she refused a first date. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, how is she that wise? Right. Right. Beyond her years. Good for and, her. And uh, it was great, but it was just interesting to see somebody actually pulling that off yeah. and come to find out, like, goodness, like it could have turned into one of those scenarios yeah. where I found myself counseling somebody like, oh man, it's too late. You know, you've already fallen in love with them. Yeah. You know, well, I became a, uh, a Christian when I was a kid. I was eight years old when I trusted Christ and I never dated anybody that wasn't like a, a committed Christian. Mm. So... 
that and I think that that was better. It just simplified things. Now, the reality is it talks about how he loves all these foreign women. A lot of times people are afraid, well, if I don't date this one unsaved guy, then I'll never meet somebody else. Dude, he met a thousand. <laughs> there's, the whole point is this. There's lots of people. And so um, if you think that you have to go find your mate and that you have to go convince them to fall in love with you, you're approaching it the wrong way because God has a plan for your life, right? So you pursue God and God will give you what God has planned for you. And it'll be far better than you going ahead and compromising everything that God has told you is right. And you compromise those things and then you settle for something that was not right. And then you're going to pay the consequences for Mm -hmm. it later. So trust that God is going to work those things out. Instead of you hunting down the right person, how about you become the right person for the one God has for you? Right. Right. Yeah. So there there was a sentence that I heard by Annie Stanley saying something like, uh, I'm not going to be able to get it in this time frame." It's something like, uh, be the person that you, oh, I know what it is. Mm-hmm. It is uh, become the person uh, that the person you're looking for is looking for. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. what it was. It was something yeah, yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's just an amazing piece of advice. Right. So if you're looking for a godly person, then you better be a godly person because a right. godly person is looking for a godly person. That's right. That's right. exactly what that means. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was a singles pastor for years. Um, you know, two, three years, I was, you know, living my life with single adults and, you know, hearing their you know, the stage of life kind of challenges. And uh, one of the best pieces of advice that I hear from them to me is that they say the best possible way to meet somebody is when you're not desperately looking for somebody. Yeah. Yeah. It really is true. true. It is true. true. So this is what we see with Solomon. He slips into this thing. And then look at verse nine, because a lot of times we think, oh, God loves us and God just wants us to be happy. There's nowhere in the Bible that says God just wants you to be happy. God wants you to be holy. God wants you to be like Jesus. God wants you to grow up in character. God wants you to do the right thing. You know where it says he just wants to be happy. Now, when you do those things, you will be happy. Right. But a lot of times we think we can dismiss all those things because this one thing makes me feel happy for a minute. Right. So happiness is a byproduct of the real goals. That's right. It's not, it's not the goal. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So sometimes then, because we think God just wants us to be happy, we're surprised when God gets angry. Right? Mm-hmm. So there is the love and the, the grace and the mercy side there's also justice. God is a just God. And so God's angry at Solomon. He warned him. Not only did he go against the warning, he winds up doing exactly what God said he was going to do, and that is you're going to wind up serving false gods. Not only does he serve false gods, he built temples for them. He built places of worship for them. Wasn't that one of the great achievements of Solomon's life was building the temple for God? Mm-hmm. And then he goes on and gets distracted. I think this is a warning for us all, that just because you had a high spiritual moment in the past does not mean that that always carries through, right? We need God's mercies to be new in our life every morning, every day, because we can't rest on some spiritual success in the past or some spiritual event in the past to carry us through the rest of our life. And something happened where he took his eyes off of God and off of what God had planned for him and put his eyes on the women that he was in love with, and they convinced him to follow other gods. Who's the author that wrote Experiencing God? Henry... Blackaby? Henry Blackaby. Mm-hmm. Henry Blackaby said when he was teaching at Dallas Theological Seminary that some of his students walked by late at night at like, you know, 11 o'clock at night, and they looked up and they had seen him studying his Bible and reading at his desk. Mm-hmm. And they had approached him and said, we can't believe that at your age, because at the time he was really old. Yeah, yeah. And they said, we can't believe, like, you've probably read the Bible so many times. And I can't believe that we just walked by. You didn't have anything else, just the Bible. That you're, you know, you're continually reading it. Like, don't you know it by now? Right. And he said, uh, I would rather have my students drink from a running stream than a stagnant pond. Mm. And mm-hmm. I thought that that was really good. Uh, you know, so in other words, yeah. he's, he's not going to say like, hey, I'm going to draw from my past. Right. I want, I want current, fresh. renewed, fresh, yep. daily blessings. Yeah. So that's really good. So verse nine says, the Lord was very angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who'd appeared to him twice. Think about this. He... God appeared to Solomon twice, and Solomon said, I think we're going to worship Molech too. Yeah. That's how dumb are we? So the, the, you know, the things in the past are the same as what happens now. Humanity is basically the same. We can have these significant spiritual encounters with God and still get pulled away by things that pull, pull, us, pull our hearts away from God. Yeah, and, and, and our listeners, there's not a person in here that's going to relate to Solomon's position like, like nobody's a no. king who builds false gods. Right. But at the same time, we do the same thing every day. Every day. So we ask the question and we say, who would do such a thing? Solomon, that's crazy. And the answer is me. Me. I would too. I yeah. would, right? Yeah. So we do it all the time. We just do it in different ways. Yeah. 
And, you know, in spite of the fact that God shows up in our lives, he rescues us, he blesses us, he comes through, we recognize it in the moment, and we're like, that is amazing. And then we turn around, and it's not too very far down the road that we decide to go back to, you know, our other ways, or forget God, or make the same mistakes. Now, there are people in the Bible who did keep following God after God made promises. You know, you got uh, Joseph, you have Joshua, you have Daniel, you have um, so many of these guys that from beginning to end, they just honored the Lord. So this isn't this isn't a justification to go, well, even Solomon did it, I guess I can do it too. Instead, this is always, God gave all these things for our example, to warn us, don't be like Solomon. Right. right? And so... Uh, in this area. Right. And so the answer uh, in this area, the answer in our life is to keep it fresh all the time with God, instead of feeling like we had a spiritual moment, and now let's move on, right? Yeah. So then ultimately, God does keep his promises to David. He lets Solomon continue keeping one part of the kingdom, but they wind up losing the rest. And that's uh, that's coming up. Yeah, that's coming up. So we'll see you next time on HC Daily. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us spread the word by liking this episode and sharing it on your social media platforms. Be sure to leave a comment and review, and don't forget to give us five stars. When you do, you help us reach even more people who need a daily devotional like HC Daily. If you'd like to hear more from Chris and Jeff, They're both teaching pastors at Heritage Church, located in Southeast Michigan. You can get more of their messages by clicking on the Messages tab at heritagechurch.com. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode of HC Daily.